What is going on everybody? Today we're back at Historic Auto Attractions Museum in Roscoe, Illinois, and I'm going to give you part two of the museum tour. Now if you haven't seen part one yet, um, I posted it a couple weeks ago and I will post a link to it in the description of this video. Now we're walking by the Hall of Wax Presidents, which I highlighted in the last video, but there's a lot more of this museum to see. I showed you probably one third of what they have to offer here. So let's go take a look at the rest. Now I suppose we're going to have to start part two with Miss Belvedere. Now Miss Belvedere was a 1957 Plymouth Belvedere that was meant to be a time capsule in Tulsa. It was supposed to be a 50 year time capsule and it was a big ordeal and they decided to give this car away to the person who guessed what the future population was going to be. And what happened was, I'll show you right up here. The, um, they put this car in an underground vault and they didn't think that anything could, uh, anything could wreck it. And basically water penetrated this thing and ruined the car when they uh, had the grand ceremony. They uncovered the car, they took the plastic off and they saw this. It looks like a shipwreck that's been sitting at the bottom of the ocean for 50 years. It's, you know, aside from looking like kind of like Titanic wreckage or something like that. It's, um, you know, this is something that was very embarrassing to the city of Tulsa. They did not want this car. They did not want to display it. So it was uh, sent here to historic auto attractions. Pretty cool piece of American history. Now let's just keep on going. Now, if you guys are interested in fire engines or fire apparatus, this is an 1859 Hunneman & Company hand-drawn manual tub pumper. Now, this is one of the types of things that they would use to fight fires back in the day. And this thing is in remarkably good condition. But this is a pretty cool piece of American history right here, too. Here's a couple of pretty cool old cars here. This one right here is a 1912 Ford Model T Roadster. And just over here, we have a 1906 Orient Buckboard. It said only 3,000 of these were manufactured from 1903 to 1907. There's only 18 of these known to exist. Here's a 1914 Ford Model T touring car. Now this is also the car that was the first Ford to climb Pikes Peak, July 1st, 1916. Take a look at that. That is awesome. Right behind that we have a Florida Swamp Buggy, which I guess this is a big thing down in Florida, Swamp Races. If you guys know anything about this, leave a comment, because I'm kind of curious about this, but I've never really heard of it. Florida Swamp Buggy. And over here we have the, this is the Illinois Stock Car Hall of Fame. And there's a couple of uh, stock cars here that I'll show you guys. This is a car that belonged to Jim O'Connor. Let's just see inside here. And then over here, this is a car that has an insane amount of value and just really cool in terms of NASCAR history. This is Richard Petty's, I believe this is a 1960 Plymouth. This is the car that Richard Petty was driving during his career wins number two, three, and four of his NASCAR career. In comparison to how things look today, this is pretty simple. He had a little fan in there, or maybe they just added that, but pretty simple. But if you like NASCAR, they have a lot of really cool stuff in here. And it doesn't matter if you like history, if you like racing, if you like old cars, if you like Hollywood history, pretty much everything that you can think of, they have it. Just over here, they have a couple of old gas pumps. couple of water fountains if you get thirsty. 
And then over here they have Mark Martin's old car. Now I think this was a, a short tracker car before he was in NASCAR. I'm not the world's greatest authority on NASCAR, although I did follow it back in the 90s. Here is Tim Richmond's car. Now Tim Richmond died pretty young if I recall. But he was a, a very good driver. Over here we have some race used suits. We have one from Dale Earnhardt and Dale Earnhardt Jr. If you've ever been curious what a race car looks like, they have this one. This was Dick Trickle's car. And you can actually see the inside of it. One side of it still has the, uh, the sheet metal. The other side does not. Over here we have a race car driven by Bobby Allison, 1977 Monte Carlo, number 28. Let you see the inside of this one too. Pretty cool stuff. And they have one more Dick Trickle car. Now, as you guys may or may not know, Dick Trickle made a, a major name for himself in the Midwest, driving a short track. Pretty tragic what happened to him. I'm sure we'll do a video on him at some point in the future. And over here they have a racing helmet that's signed by all these guys over here. And one name they did not mention, let me see if I can show you guys, right there on the side, right in the center of your screen if you can see it. Hopefully you can, I can't see the camera right now, but I try it again right there. In the back, Paul Newman signed the top of that helmet too. And if you guys like cars, this is a Tucker 48 engine. Now they only made, I believe, 48 Tuckers and they or 51 original cars were completed including the initial prototype but they made 98 engines there's not very many of these in public uh on public display anymore but that's pretty cool and if you've had enough of racing in cars let's go into the war room here's some uniforms that were worn at pearl harbor december 7th 1941 it's a huge day in history. It's kind of cool to just see this stuff and realize what uh, what existed when these uniforms were being worn and just what happened, what, uh, you know, these things have seen history. And speaking of history, here is one other piece that I think is really, really cool. This is the War Room Fireplace Mantle from the Harry Truman administration. Now it was on this mantle in the presence of a Secretary of State and a Secretary of War. Harry Truman signed the order to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, forever changing the world. He signed it right here on this mantle. That just blows my mind. And there's some other Hiroshima artifacts here. We have Paul Tibbetts hat. Now Paul Tibbetts was the pilot of the Enola Gay that dropped the first atomic bomb over Hiroshima. But this was his hat that was assigned to him at, when he was a pilot. So he very well could have been wearing this hat when the, when the bomb was dropped. This was signed by the Enola Gay crew. melted bottle from the blast and some fused coins now here's a 1941 packard clipper this was a u.s army staff car this one's in pretty good shape too give you a little look inside here Now, if you guys are anything like me history has always fascinated me especially presidential history and just because of that, 
that's one of the many reasons that I love this museum because they have a lot of presidential artifacts. This isn't exactly presidential right here, but this is, they have two different cases like this of all different hats from different war eras. This is just crazy. And they even have a replica warship. Now, I can't even imagine what life would have been like back then. I know my grandpa did serve in World War II, and I remember hearing some stories, but he didn't want to tell a whole lot about them because he lost all of his friends basically in the war. So it was one of those kind of things that you never knew if, you, if it was safe to bring up. But I love hearing stories about the war. Now, they also have a room filled with clocks. But some of my favorite ones are over here. These are presidential clocks of the White House. This right up here is a Grover Cleveland era clock. There you go. This is from Zachary Taylor's presidency. This one was from Dwight Eisenhower. This one was used during the Calvin Coolidge administration. The Herbert Hoover administration. This was from the Harry or Harry Truman from the White House study. This one was from the William Howard Taft administration. This is one of FDR's clocks from the from the White House library. And this one's pretty cool. This is from, this dates back to 1833. This is Andrew Jackson's clock. It says this clock is the oldest artifact in this museum's collection. And over here we have some celebrity automobiles. This is Conway Twitty's car. Well, it was. Give you a little look in there. Have his suit coat over there, the sign guitar. And over here, they have an oversized guitar along with Patsy Klein items. Over here, they have Patsy Klein's dress. This was donated by her husband. Patsy Klein's wigs. Her boots and one of her hats as well as shoes blouse and purse and then a couple other artifacts down here I believe that's a, a hat case and over here we have a case of Hank Williams items now, Hank Williams legendary musician Passed away way too young. His shirt, you can see him wearing right there in that picture. A couple of hats. Hank Williams glasses. And another one of his shirts. Do you think that would still be uh, fashionable today? I don't know. Let me know. Here's the 1967 Lincoln Continental Lehman Peterson limousine that was owned by Hugh Hefner. And this is the car that would drop off and pick up movie stars, playmates, pretty much whoever else needed a ride. So I'm sure that there were a lot of drunken happenings that happened in this car. Well, if the walls of this thing could talk. Let's see if you can see in there at all. Hopefully you can see in there a little bit. Over here we have Howard Hughes' car. Howard Hughes, he was an interesting guy. Had a lot of money, created some interesting films, and he was a pioneer in the aviation world. And he also was known for living in the Beverly Hills Hotel, and I believe he 
It was rumored that he would hide in the trees or have roast beef sandwiches hidden in the trees and then he'd go find them. Something to that effect. He was a goofy guy. Here's the, the Chariot from Ben-Hur, famous 1959 film. And then we have some Harry Houdini items. This was his show trunk. We have some, some of his personalized handcuffs and his signature. And a straight jacket. Now it says that this was used by Houdini in his historic straight jacket escape act. That is pretty neat. They have his key making die, a leg iron, double lock leg iron, and a double lock bar cuff. Houdini, legendary musician. And when I say this place has everything, I mean they have everything. Here is a letter signed by Thomas Edison. And these were Thomas Edison's reading glasses. Said that they were acquired in 1971 by the curators of the Edison collection. That was housed in the home of one of the, one of the inventor's sons, Charles, who was also the former governor of New Jersey. And right next door is another famous pair of glasses. If you guys have ever seen National Treasure with Nicolas Cage, let me try to get a picture of that without the glare. If you guys remember these, when he was trying to decode the cipher, pretty great uh, moment in that film. Now they even have a 9-11 memorial. the names of all those that perished. Why, what a horrible day that was. It's one of the days that everybody remembers where they were at on that day. Really makes you think and appreciate the sacrifice that everybody made on that day. And for the people that didn't make it. Now these over here are the original blueprints of the Twin Towers. Now you guys might not be able to fully appreciate the size of this from this video, but this is huge. It's Tower B. They even have a Hall of Christ. This looks like a very peaceful place to be and contemplate your life's choices. Right over here, these are the relics of the room. These are stones from Jerusalem. Some really nice stained glass. They even have Colonel Sanders' white suit and his famous bow tie. That is pretty snazzy. They also have his car. This is his 1939 Lincoln K. It's a pretty sharp automobile. It has the CS right here on the back. Kind of wonder how many times he ate his own chicken in this car. Maybe never, but you never know. Here's a couple more presidential pieces. This is a presidential chair that was used by Abraham Lincoln in his rail car. Pretty well worn. Here is a funeral dress. It says this black dress was worn by Mrs. Frances Blair at the funeral of Abraham Lincoln. 
Francis Blair was a pioneer in the founding of the Republican Party and served as President Abraham Lincoln in an informal capacity many times. And then over here, this is a dress and shoes that were owned by Mary Todd Lincoln. Now take a look at the size of these shoes. Hopefully this translates on video, but these things are insanely tiny. I don't think too many people could fit their feet in these. Now this is one of my favorite exhibits here. This is the Lincoln exhibit. This is where you get your money's worth in here. Now this room is lined with, with artifacts and facts about Lincoln, photos. A very well done exhibit. But we'll start over here. This is a drapery cord from Lincoln's home in Springfield. So Lincoln most likely touched this pretty much every day. One of the first things I'd like to show you, this is a 35 star flag. Now if this isn't rare enough, this may very well be the flag that was behind Abraham Lincoln when he gave his famed Gettysburg Address speech. Now it says that this flag design was used July 4th, 1863 to July 4th, 1865 during the time of the Lincoln administration. Now this flag was owned by Master Sergeant Smith Stimmel, who was a bodyguard and a flag bearer to President Lincoln. He was also present during the Gettysburg Address, and that's, that's why they think that this might be the flag that was behind Lincoln um, during that speech. Here is one of Mary Todd Lincoln's black mourning veils. And a mourning fan. And over here, the Lincoln relics just keep on continuing. This is a personal razor of Abraham Lincoln. And a spoon of Abraham Lincoln. Now it's believed that this one was stepped on by a horse. Thus the, uh, the damage there. Here is a White House chair. This is Abraham Lincoln's chair from his personal study next to the Oval Office. Pretty well worn. Now I was told that this was his one of his favorite chairs, so this thing was obviously used quite a bit. Now, if you guys know much about the conspirators, you might have you might know the name Louis Payne. This is him right here. He was one of the conspirators that was brought into the uh, the Lincoln assassination. These are the handcuffs or manacles worn by Louis Payne when he was when he was hung. These are some bandages that were around Mary Surratt's hand when she was hung. And also bits of rope from Surratt's, George Atzerott's, Payne's, and Harold's hanging ropes. And Mary Todd Lincoln's mourning skirt. It says that she wore this when her son Willie died in the White House in 1862, and then again in 1865 after Lincoln was assassinated. And Mrs. Lincoln gave this dress to her friend, Mrs. James Knowlton of Chicago. And then we have the Lincoln deathbed relics, which I think these are some of the most fascinating things. And we're going to talk to Tony, the historian here, about how they acquired these, because this is a fascinating story. This is one of the coins that was placed on Lincoln's eyelid after he passed away. And this is a blood-stained handkerchief that was wrapped around Lincoln's head after his death to keep his jaw closed. And then the group of six handles from Abraham Lincoln's coffin. Now Abraham Lincoln did not rest peacefully for about 40 years after he passed away. He kept, um, you know, he would be laid to rest, then he would be brought back up, they would open the casket, they would look to make sure it was still him. Um, his people around him did not really take very good care of him in death. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating story and probably worthy of its own video, but um, the original casket did not fit into the sarcophagus that they made for Lincoln's tomb. So these are the original handles from the original coffin. These came from the collection of Herbert Wells Fay, who was the longtime caretaker of the Lincoln tomb. 
And this right here is a chair that was used and owned by Martin Luther King Jr. It says this chair was used in his cabin hideaway where he pondered the profound ideas he presented in his late writings. Right there. And a wax figure of Dr. King. Now at this point we've covered about half of the museum, so this is going to do it for part two of this museum tour, but stay tuned because there's going to be a part three and a part four to show you guys as much of this place as I possibly can. As always, feel free to ask any questions uh, for me, for the historian or the owner of this place, but thanks so much for watching guys and we'll catch you on the next part of the tour.